hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this month's webinar for busy lawyers. I'm Susan Letterman White. I'm one of the practice advisors here at Mass Lomap, and we are delighted to have you with us today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Megan Xavier. She focuses her practice exclusively on attorney ethics, representing attorneys facing state bar disciplinary action, providing guidance to practicing attorneys on questions of legal ethics, broadcasting about legal ethics on lawyers gone ethical, and writing about ethics on at thelawyerist.com, attorneyatwork.com, and her own blog, californiastatebardefense.com. Before I turn it over to Megan, I just want to let you know that we will have time at the end of the session for all kinds of questions. All you need to do is type them right into the chat box and I promise you, I will relay each and every one to Megan at the end. Um, so Megan, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Um, so yeah, as Susan mentioned, I'm an ethics attorney, I'm kind of a rules geek. And so the stuff about social media and other business related topics and the ethical implications of them are what I do, I like to dig into these. Um, so let's get started. First question, can we just ignore modern technology? And when I say modern technology, I actually do mean social media. This is a social media talk, but this, this all comes within the realm of tech. And no, no, we can't <laughs> actually just ignore it. And you know, I hear from people all the time, but I hate social media. I just hate it. Why do I have to learn anything about it? Well, I totally agree, honestly. I'm, talk about social media. I advocate getting on there and using it for your business. I definitely am on there myself, but I totally get hating it. I was a late adopter myself and I really don't always enjoy being on social media, but you can't avoid it because it finds you even if you don't want to be there. You'll find that people are trying to tag you or people want you to see something that they saw on social media. If you opt out completely, you're really actually missing out. Also, it's actually useful, believe it or not. Being on social media allows a lot of networking opportunities. It allows some client um, communication opportunities, not just straight up marketing, and we'll talk about that, but really using it to be out there is very useful. And clients expect it. Our clients are more and more on social than ever before, and that's only going to continue to increase. So if you intend to stay in business and practice law in the next couple of decades, you're gonna be on social media. There's really just no avoiding it. And of course, from the ethics standpoint, there's the duty of technological competence, right? Which is a comment to rule 1.1 of the ABA model rules. I think we're up to 38 states adopting it. Um, Bob Ambrosi keeps track of this. He has a great website where he keeps adding to it. Massachusetts adopted the comment, um, the duty of technological competence in 2015. And what it basically says is you've got to keep up with what's going on in technology or you're not able to do your job competently. You're not able to meet your ethical obligations. And a lot of people want to say, well, that has to do with, you know, using Microsoft Word, redacting a PDF properly, e-filing when it's required. Yeah, those things all come in there, but actually social media does as well. What the, the rule says that, you know, we can't provide competent or we must provide competent representation. The comment, which I have here on the screen, is that to maintain the requisite knowledge and skill to meet our duty of competence, we need to keep abreast of benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Well, social media falls into that category. For example, if you are litigating and there's social media evidence and you really don't understand social media, how it's used, how it's shared, well, you're going to miss important things that go to the duty of competence, right? You're not gonna perform competently if you're not understanding its use. So you do need to be paying attention to it and learning how to use it and how it works. Now, this doesn't mean you're only concerned about your own social media use. I'm gonna give you some tips in this presentation about how can you be using it effectively, what should you be avoiding, but you need to actually be concerned with other people's use of social media as well. For example, you've gotta understand it enough to control your client's use of social media. 
I recognize we're never going to completely control them, but they can kill a case. Right? If you're in litigation and your social me media savvy client is out there posting something um, and you have no idea how it works, what they're doing, you're not monitoring them, you're not advising them on how to use it effectively, they could actually kill your case. I've got a good example of that in a moment. Um, you should also be watching your adversaries, the other parties and the other counsel, because they can trip up and you can miss an opportunity to use that against them um, or in your client's favor in, in cases. And of course, ourselves don't fall into the traps that we're going to be talking about today. And employees, they can also really mess up your work. If you're supervising other lawyers, you should have a social media policy and right? you should be talking to them about their use of social media and to make sure they're utilizing it ethically. So basically, you've got to be paying attention to social media across the board. And what kind of behavior am I talking about when I say you've got to pay attention to social media? Obviously, the most clear example is you need to watch what people are posting and what you post. Very clear example, right? But there's other things as well, liking other people's posts, sharing them, commenting on them. One of the examples I have today of lawyers behaving badly on social media is about the comments. So sometimes the comments are just horrible. Um, endorsing what other people are saying. Now, a like isn't necessarily an endorsement, but what about a reshare that says, yes, this? Well, now that person who's shared it has endorsed what the other person posted. You're wanting to be aware of that and be watching that. So basically any social media interaction is what we're talking about today, where you wanna make sure that you're following the ethics rules and doing this in a useful way. So I have a few examples, starting with the client's use of social media, um, to give you some context of why we wanna make sure that we're paying attention. Um, I love hot moms, you see that on the screen. We refer to this often as the I love hot moms case. It's actually lesser, it's uh, Lester Concrete was the, uh, is the, actually the name of the case, but I love Hot Moms, it's so much catchier. So this was a case where a cement truck um, plowed into a woman um, who was in her vehicle and, and killed her. So the widower, young man, sued the concrete company for wrongful death, which is totally valid, right? Super valid claim, really sympathetic story. However, the young man, the widower, had a Facebook page and he liked to party. So there were a bunch of pictures of him drinking beer and partying with women in a t-shirt that read, I love hot moms. Well, his lawyer recognized that that was not going to make him look super sympathetic to the jury, right? Young man lost his wife, just getting started out in life. Oh, wait a minute, he's out partying? not that long after she died and with a shirt that says that, you know, it's kind of distasteful. He knew this was going to be a problem at trial. So what the lawyer did was he told his paralegal to tell the client, delete your Facebook page. I don't want to see those posts. I don't want to see you to have a Facebook account at all. So the client did. He went and deleted it. Now this is where it kind of goes way beyond just social media behavior, but it's a good example of how far this can go. So they had a discovery request and it asked about the client's social media presence. And in that response, signed under penalty of perjury, they said, oh, he doesn't have a Facebook account. Well, the opposing counsel were not dumb. They had already pulled his Facebook page right before they deleted it. So they already had a printout of the publicly available Facebook page. So they already knew about the I Love Hot Moms uh, posts and pictures. Well, they went to trial. He won a huge verdict. I mean, the, the young man had a very large verdict against the, the concrete company. And then this was brought to the judge's attention that there was foliation of evidence. There was false discovery responses. At first, the court dramatically cut the jury award that did end up being reinstated. So the client um, did have some sanctions he had to pay, but the bulk of the award was reinstated for the client. The lawyer was not so lucky. His name is Matthew Murray. And if you Google Matthew Murray, 
actually, I think first you get a serial killer from like the 1700s, but you will see Matthew Murray, the attorney from Virginia. He had a $542,000 sanction ordered against him. That's tremendously huge. If you have ever been sanctioned, you know, we're usually talking a couple thousand dollars for bad behavior. Yeah, $542,000. He was also suspended for five years. Now, in the attorney discipline world, I mean, that just kind of made my jaw drop because in some states, California being one, the basic tenet is if the behavior warrants two years or more suspension, you should be disbarred. Like there's not a five-year suspension available in every state. So that was tremendous. So it's a, kind of an extreme example, but you've got to notice that that's just starting with, oh, I don't like my client's behavior on social media. Had that attorney had a conversation at the first meeting with the new client and said, listen, this is really important. You need to pay attention to your social media use. It might have all turned out differently. And there's a lot of examples that are a lot more everyday behavior on social media, and I'm going to run through several of these. Um, Betty Samus is an attorney in Illinois, and it's unfortunate, but Googling her brings up this saga, actually, I think even before her law firm shows up. So social media includes online reviews. This is social interaction online. It doesn't mean it has to be Twitter or Facebook. It can be Avo and reviews and responses to reviews. So Betty was an employment lawyer, or is an employment lawyer, and she had a client come to her and he said, you know, this is my deal, this is my case, do I have a case? And she actually told him, I really don't think you have a case. I don't think you should bring this, you're going to lose. And he said, well, I really want you to do it anyway. I'm going to give you $1,500, please, please, please file my case. So red flag, right? She never should have taken the case. She knew it was a loser, but she took it. He insisted, he said he understood, he wanted to try anyway. Well, it didn't turn out so well. He lost, he got mad, he wanted his $1,500 back, and he went online to Avo and he left her a bad review. She accepted a $1,500 fee knowing full well that I was never going to win. Well, that's true, but she told him and he made the choice anyway. But he just wanted his $1,500 back. But she called him and she said, will you please take down this review? And he said, for $1,500, give me my refund and I'll take it down. And she refused. And this is where the attorney's bad behavior comes in. She violated the confidentiality rules by posting a response. Now you can post responses. I have whole conversations with lawyers all the time on this. We give presentations on how to effectively respond. I'm not saying it's improper use of social media to respond. What I'm saying is you gotta be really careful. And she was not. So she responded, and she said, I dislike it very much when my clients lose, but I cannot invent positive facts for clients when they're not there. I feel badly for him, but his own actions in beating up a female coworker are what caused the consequences he is now so upset about. Well, this is not okay. I think we can probably all see that. And she was publicly reprimanded. And then there's everyday conduct that comes into play with lawyers getting in trouble on social media. Sometimes it's not as earth shattering as, oh my gosh, I got a bad review. I'm gonna go respond to it. Sometimes it's just your daily conduct. So here's a great example. There was an attorney who went to the judge and said, I really need a continuance. My father died. I'm so broken up. I need to go take care of some family things. Can you please give me continuance? And the judge granted it because judges do usually have hearts and understand lives and granted the continuance. Only judges also have Facebook, and judges clerks have Facebook. And she went out drinking and partying all week and put that out on social media. Well, the judge took back that continuance, he granted, and she was in a whole heap of trouble. Then there's Sean Conway in Florida. He's another great example. Being angry at the judge. Who, who hasn't ever been angry at a judge, right? We all do it. I have a daughter who's now 10. She went to trial with me when she was six. She still talks about that judge as the worst judge in the world because she heard it from us, right? We say those things sometimes about judges and we get really upset. Well, he took it online and he blogged. Blogging also is social media. It's putting it out there where people can comment and have interaction. You're online. That's social media. 
So he was angry at the judge. He posted that she was an evil, unfair witch, which is not showing respect to the tribunal the way that our rules require us to do. And the Florida bar both fined him and reprimanded him. Now, more everyday conduct. Um, confidentiality violating posts. Now, I went on Facebook to a couple of lawyer groups and spent about five minutes before um, a presentation a couple of years ago. I said, I need to find some good examples of some you know, really bad posts because I had noticed that this was happening a lot. It literally took me five minutes and I had so many examples I could fill an hour. Okay, lawyers are doing this all the time. It doesn't mean that you should. This is one of those great examples of just because you see someone else doing it doesn't mean that's actually the appropriate standard. So I've got a couple examples to show you. Because remember, we still have our duty of confidentiality, even when we're online. We tend to violate that pretty easily in things like coffee shop talk or cocktail party chats with other lawyers. We really shouldn't be, but it has become kind of a longstanding tradition in our profession to commiserate with other lawyers and say, oh, I've got this client. Oh, yeah, me too. And they'll share stories. We never should have been doing that, even over coffee or drinks. But when it goes online, it becomes an even bigger problem because now you have, first of all, the permanency of those posts and a huge audience. So this was when a lawyer was upset, they're on vacation, criminal client is, is texting or calling them. You know, criminal client avoiding prison for multiple cases, currently on probation, who wants to be able to contact the victim. You know, I thought we were done. I sent a closing letter. Do I really need to do anything else? Well, that's not appropriate to be put on Facebook, but what's worse were all the comments. And she actually posted the texts. Okay, so she recognized that there was a bit of a problem with posting the texts because she started to redact pieces of it, right? She redacted some of the details, their name, um, their phone number, the victim's name. So she's like, realized, oh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't share all of this, but still shared the texts. We just still put that out there. That's so not okay. And then the comments, I mean, I don't have them here. I, I, I pulled out that slide, but they were horrible. And there were all kinds of inappropriate advice from other lawyers, you know, telling her to do even worse things than honestly posting his texts were. So here it's like an everyday interaction, you know, that coffee shop talk, that cocktail party, brought online just balloons. And it's so, so terrible for lawyers to be doing something like that. And it goes on, you know, I've got other examples here like the oversharing post. This is just unprofessional. Maybe it doesn't violate an ethics rule, but this is not the proper use of social media. Here they're talking about their employees. Senior paralegal can't stand their junior associate and what should I be doing with this? Just, you know, really just not professional, not why we should be on social media. And here's another one that's just so clearly violating confidences and privilege, talking about sitting through their deposition with their client and how their client lied. You know, here the opposing counsel pulls out um, evidence that completely contradicts the client and makes it clear, I wanted the chair to swallow me. So commenting on how her client's lies impacted her, not okay. This is not why we should be out there. And then I just had to throw this one in because it's just such a great, it's hilarious and it's a great example of the kind of thing you just want to share sometimes. And especially if you're a solo, you want to walk down the hall and tell somebody like I used to do in firms and as a solo, you're like I have no one to tell. But no, you should not be posting on Facebook your client when your client attempts to justify why the prostitute he spent $450 on was a business expense. Not appropriate. This is not why we need to be on social. Last example, when you have a client that you want to put out there and put a win on social media, this is also not how you do it. Then we're going to turn to all the ways that you do do this, right? Um, here's an example where the lawyer probably asked his client, Carlos, he beat a weed case for Carlos just by showing up to trial, right? They did a great job. I'm sure in the parking lot, Okay, I'm not sure. I hope that the lawyer actually said, hey, Carlos, can I take your picture and put this on Facebook? And to which the client probably said, sure. I mean, he's obviously posing, right? He's clearly 
a willing participant in this picture, but he takes the picture and he puts it out there. And honestly, do you think that he had true informed consent from his client? Probably not. Um, informed consent requires a lot more than, hey, dude, can I take your picture? Cool, man. All right, put it out there with your picture, your name, my name, my phone number, your charge that you just beat. So now you don't have to disclose that to the rest of the world, but we've just put it on Facebook where it will remain forever. Because remember, you can't stop someone from sharing it, saving it. You could delete that post later, but it may still be out there. So what can you do? What should you be doing on, on social media? How can you be using it effectively? Because I did start at the beginning saying, right, we, we've got to be out there. You should be on social media. If you're not, you're missing networking opportunities. You're missing opportunities to speak to your client base. It's just not a good idea to stick your head in the sand. Well, here are some of my top tips for how to be using social media properly. First of all, use privacy settings. Understand the platforms that you're on and how to control the privacy settings. It is worth diving into one platform and learning how to use it well and learning how to use its settings rather than jumping onto multiple platforms that you don't understand. So use those settings to control who can see your posts, who can tag you. That's a dangerous thing when you're on social and someone else writes something that you have no control over, you may not even see and they tag you. If they tag you, you should get a notification, but maybe you missed that one, right? You can control whether other people can tag you. So go in and learn those settings and use them properly. Now, don't friend anyone you don't know. Once you have connected with someone, um, particularly on Facebook, which is where friend comes from, um, on Twitter and things you follow, which is really pretty safe to follow other people, uh, but don't friend people on Facebook if you don't know them. Once you friend someone, they can see more of your posts and they can typically share more of your posts. So if you don't actually know them, then you've just given them access to what you've got going in Facebook. So they can be sharing it, they can be tagging you, they can see things about you. Be more judicious about who you're friending. If you're using Facebook for business, make a business page. Don't just use your personal page and that way you can avoid some of that. Clients can like your business page, you can share information there without opening up your personal page. Because like the third bullet here, remember you cannot control what your friends do with your photos or what you've posted um, except for those privacy settings. So beyond that, you really can't control them. And even if you have it set, say you can't share a particular post, people can still cut and paste. They can still tag you. So once it's out there, you should assume it could go viral. You know, have that in the back of your head. Odds aren't very good that anything one of us is gonna post is gonna go viral. But if you have that approach to it and that mindset that anything you post could go viral, that will help you rein it in, what you're doing on it. Um, don't use social networking while under the influence. <laughs> that might sound kind of silly. We talked about drunk dialing, right? Other things that you shouldn't do under the influence. Don't get on social media. I've seen some pretty atrocious posts. And even if you wake up in the morning, you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. And you go back and delete it. The damage can already be done. You know, everyone that you're connected to saw what you posted. It didn't have a little asterisk. I'm drunk as writing this. Maybe people will figure it out, maybe not. Maybe you're gonna be super belligerent. Just make a rule that you just don't do that. Um, and don't talk about your cases online. Um, even in private functions on, on the social platforms like chats or closed or even secret groups, it's just not the place to have any of your case information out there, even in hypothetical form. You, you need to have a network where you can ask questions about cases, you know, substantive law questions, business approach questions, client relations questions, but social media is not the place for it. Those posts that I have as those examples from other lawyers um, posting inappropriately, that's often what they're using social for is that networking that is just not appropriate for, for that use. Um, and be wary of inquiries that come to you through social media channels. Some are obviously spam, 
you'll get like message requests on Twitter or um, on Facebook as well. It comes up as a request by someone who's not connected to you. Just watch out um, for who's contacting you. And when someone is contacting you who wants to be a client, don't use the social platform to develop that relationship. Take them off of the platform and into your normal intake process. So for example, if someone Facebook messages, messages you and says, I want to hire you, I need help, and I think you can help me, I'd like to hire you. Don't interact there. I mean, we have no control over what goes on with that data. I mean, that is not a secure channel for that person to spill their confidential information to you. So immediately take them off of there. Say, thank you so much for contacting me. Here's my intake process, you know, whatever that is. Call our office, fill out this form, go on my website, whatever your intake process is, divert them there instead of cultivating a relationship on social media. And when you are posting, this is not the place to just market yourself. It's not gonna work for one thing. Um, people aren't going on social media to see attorneys posting like, I'm so great, hire me. I just want a bunch of money for somebody. You want, you want to hire me to get your money for your case? Like, no, this just isn't it, okay? That's not what it's for. Um, you see attorneys doing it. They're usually muted, blocked, unfriended, unliked. Um, people don't want to hear that. That's just not why they're there. So it's not going to work. It's not effective, you're not helping yourself. Now it's just a big waste of time. Also, some of the posts along those lines, you're violating the attorney advertising rules. So there's really no point in it in the first place, plus you might get yourself in ethics trouble. So similar to don't, um, I gotta come, come up with a good term for this, like the drunk dialing, don't drunk post. Um, also don't post in anger. That's kind of how we see people get in trouble with those online reviews and responding to them. It's usually a defensive mechanism when you're really angry. They just read this negative review and they go, what? That's not what happened. And then they type out a response. Um, even outside of that context, even just a simple Facebook post or tweet, don't do it when you're mad. It's just not a good idea. Nothing good is going to come from an angry so social media post. Um, also, make sure you're proofreading. I raise my hand on this one. I've, I've put stuff out there that later, I go, oh gosh, that's completely, you know, typo or said something stupid that, you know, I just didn't proofread it to realize it didn't make sense. Now, some social platforms you can go back and edit, like Facebook. You cannot edit a tweet on Twitter. That's a big thing that a lot of us would like to see changed. Um, and so to some extent, if you just posted it and go, oop, there's a typo, you can delete it right away, repost it, fixed, and you're good. But what if a whole bunch of people have already seen it? First of all, the impression's made. So even if you delete it, the impression's still out there that maybe you're, you are an idiot. Um, but if people have commented and there's good dialogue going, which is what we hoped for, for the interaction on social, um, you probably don't want to delete it then, but you're stuck with your typo. And you can go and comment like, whoops, I had a typo. But sometimes it goes beyond typo and you just really do look kind of dumb and it's out there when it's too late. Um, the don't discuss cases, colleagues, parties, and judges. I think that was clear, hopefully, from the, my bad examples. And then lastly, very much an ethics issue. You may not use social media deceitfully. So there's a lot of cases on this, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of opining from ethics regulators, but you can't go out there and, for example, friend someone under false pretenses just to gain access to the opposing party or a witness's Facebook page. Um, so just think about that on social. You've got to be not only authentic about your post, that, hey, this is really who I am, but also you've got to be using it honestly. And I'll just close out with um, this quote that I like from, from Georgia. Here, I, I live in Georgia, and Georgia has a lawyer's creed and aspirational statement on professionalism that I just think is a good sort of marker for how we should be behaving online as well. So it just says to model that one of our aspirations is to model for others, and particularly our clients, the respect due to those we call upon to resolve our disputes, the courts, 
and with re due re regard due to all participants in our dispute resolution processes. So all of our parties are witnesses, opposing counsel. When we're on social media, treat them all professionally, remain professional in your interactions, and you'll probably be on the safe ethics side. And of course, here's my contact information if anyone has questions after we're done here today. Megan, thank you so much. That was so informative. It was a great presentation. Um, I wanna give people a little bit of a opportunity to write in any questions they have, um, but I have a question for you. Sure. Well, can you say something about the um, Facebook and LinkedIn business pages? Because you did mention not, you know, not to really promote yourself, but I think that's kind of what the business pages do. Well, they're, they're out there to, you know, be sort of a central forum for your business. So they're a great place to say things like, we're offering a new service line, or wow, we had a great day today, we got a great review. You can say good things about your business, but that's not the same as just shilling for yourself. Um, you'll see some people, such as on um, Twitter or any, sort of on the news feeds, right, coming through your personal Facebook um, or on Twitter where they're just, they're just trying to sell their services. That's not the point. A business page is absolutely, you know, also sometimes called a fan page, which we usually we see a fan page more like for a singer, right? But um, you can have that as a bit in your head as a business page as well. Like this is for people who want to learn more about your business, mm -hmm. kind of like your website, um, but in a social setting. You're going to talk more about what's going on with your business, but it shouldn't be salesy. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's any more than really your website should be overly salesy, but even more so on social, you're interacting. You're trying to provide useful information to interact with people who are showing an interest in your business, mm -hmm. which is different than just marketing and selling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll see if I have one more question here as we wait for other people to jump on with questions. Um, you, the examples you were giving us of bad behavior, I noticed they were all Facebook. Is Facebook a little trickier than, say, LinkedIn or Twitter or I don't even know anything about Instagram, to be honest, other than that? <laughs> um, um, Facebook's just a really great breeding ground for some bad behavior for pulling examples. Um, Twitter tends to be a little bit better. In, it's not really so much that I think people behave better there. Um, it's limited in how much you can put out there. Um, Facebook does a lot of the cultivating of groups. And so, whereas like a lawyer, so, so for me, for example, I'm very active on Twitter. If I had a question, like one of those lawyers, right? Like, should I really have to respond to this guy that I closed his file? If I go on Twitter, I'd be putting it out to all, you know, however many thousands of people see my tweets. Some are lawyers, some aren't, some are friends. I also wouldn't post that in my general Facebook feed to, I've got teachers at school I'm friends with, right? People who have nothing to do with my legal profession. But Facebook has these groups. And so I belong to groups where I know everyone seeing my post is a lawyer. And so they all have the context to respond to me. And I'm kind of like going to my little private, in my head private, um, group of lawyer friends to ask. Mm -hmm. So Facebook cultivates that with those groups that I think is just kind of a breeding ground for some of these bad posts. Like mm -hmm. those almost all came out of um, groups. Gotcha, oh, that's interesting. Good to yeah. know. Yeah, not the client one. The client one comes out of like putting on the, the lawyer's personal page and his, and his business page, the picture with the client. Mm -hmm. um, and there too, there's a huge broad reach with Facebook. I mean, even when we hate it, it seems like almost everybody's on it nonetheless. Yeah, true. Um, all right, well, I wanna thank you so much for your time today and your expertise, we really appreciate it. I wanna thank everybody for listening in. Um, also, if you are around on June 19th, Dina, or, sorry, Dina Eisenberg is going to talk about outsourcing your overflow work. Same time, same place. Hope you'll join us. Until then, thanks again and have a great afternoon, everybody.